Awesome. And good readings today. Beautiful readings today. Our Basur readings are quite uh, provocative, aren't they? Um, a man named Yair, or um, Jairus, was an official at the synagogue. Stern translates his title, President of the Synagogue. And he comes to Yeshua in desperation. He falls at his feet. He pleads with Yeshua. And his only daughter is dying. She is just 12 years old, just before she was about to become a woman. Yeshua goes to his house. But along the way, crowds press in around him, and it's chaos. And a woman who has been hemorrhaging for, again, 12 years, manages to draw near and perhaps crawling through the crowd. She reaches out and takes hold of one of Yeshua's tzitzit. Yeshua stops. Power has gone out from him. And he says, who touched me? And the disciples look around and say, everyone's touching you. How could you know? Shaking with fear, the woman throws herself, it says, at his feet, saying, I was instantly healed the moment I touched your tzitzit. And Yeshua looks into her eyes and says, my daughter, your faithfulness has healed you. Go in shalom. Then news comes from the house of Yair that his daughter has died. There's no reason to come anymore. But Yeshua says, do not fear. Keep on trusting. She will be made well. And even though Yeshua is ridiculed because the girl is dead, he took Peter and Yochanan and Yaakov and the mother and the father into the room, and he said to her, my child, wake up. And her nephesh returned to her. And she stood up. Amazing. I mean, wouldn't, don't you wish you were there? <laughs> you know, amazing. Uh, I want to talk about healing prayer today. I think it's a good time. Um, let me ask you a, a question. How many of you feel that, as far as you know, um, you have been healed from prayer in some way, through prayer? Yeah, raise your hand nice and high if you feel that way. As far as you know, of course, there's never certainty, as far as you know. Now, now, keep your hands up. How many of you feel that as far as you are aware, someone seemed to get better when you prayed for that person? Again, they seem to get better. We'll leave it at that. And how many of you know that someone who knows someone who really believes that they were healed from prayer? Okay, now, if you raise your hand, keep, the, keep it up. If you raise your hand at any of those three questions, keep that up. Okay, now look around just for a moment, and you'll see it's, it's uh, maybe 95% of the room and I, it's always that way when, when we, I ask these questions. And it's an amazing thing because there's something to this. You can put your hands down. Thanks. There's something to this. There's something to praying for the sick. And God heals. So this year, our theme for the Jewish year is a Rook Israel voice. And one of our projects for this spring is to relaunch our tefillah team. Tefillah, um, for those of you who are new, means prayer. And this is our healing prayer team. So what do I mean by relaunch? Uh, back in 2012, we were very intentional to launch a tefillah team. And over the next seven years, we uh, did some really neat things. We had trainings and healing services. We offered regular prayer after services for people who were struggling. And it was a real blessing for a lot of people. Uh, we even hosted three uh, kind of ecumenical healing prayer conferences called Refua Shlema over that time. And... Um, Things kind of needed a refresher, and then COVID came, and everything sort of transitioned into intercessory prayer, and uh, it, it, went, it was very important. And now we have a, a number of different important intercessory prayer things happening. Lisa runs the intercessory prayer team and sends notices out, and we have the WhatsApp thread, and people are praying for each other all the time. We've never stopped. But what we want to do is to relaunch the team, and that means we want to we get the band back together again. You know what I mean? And so we need new members. Um, there's training. There's, you, you kind of have to apply and that kind of thing. Um, but talk to me if you're interested. Um, we want to get back to laying on hands and intentionally praying for those who are suffering after services and at various different times and people who really need God's healing touch in their lives. So today what I want to do is to, um, to talk about a big vision for uh, what we've been calling here for some time a Jewish healing reawakening. I'm kind of revisioning because we've talked about this in years past, a Jewish healing reawakening. Uh, now, when we talk about 
healing prayer in Messianic Judaism, we run into a problem. Our Messianic Jewish mandate from God is to build Jewish communities for Yeshua. And this is something we, we know that hasn't been done in, what, 16 centuries or something? Uh, a Jewish reawakening in Yeshua. This is our vision. The great schism between the church and the synagogue has left its mark in history. And our Messianic Jewish movement has fought an uphill battle to recreate, to build a home for Yeshua within modern Jewish space. Now, regrettably, there is no tradition for how to pray for healing in Yeshua's merit in modern Judaism yet. <laughs> and the cultural affectation that tends to come along with uh, Christian charismatic culture is very powerful and threatens to usurp our uniquely Jewish experience in Yeshua that we have been entrusted to cultivate. You see the tension here? And those of you who have some history in Messianic Judaism will know that Historically, modern Messianic Jewish communities who have emphasized healing in the manifestations of the, the Rook, the Holy Spirit, have also largely opted out of the Jewish experience. Some Messianic Jews feel that they must give up on our Jewish calling in order to pursue what they feel like is a more spirit-filled and charismatic faith walk, while others have felt that they needed to give up on things like healing prayer because they feel that it threatens their calling to be an authentic and prophetic Jewish voice for Yeshua. Today, I think it's time for us to say no and to continue to build something new. It's the same Rook who gives us both. And they're part of one shared heritage. And, and I really believe over the years and over the decades, it's a long-term it's a long-term vision, but I believe that God is calling us Messianic Jews here at Ruach Israel to be of the first Messianic Jews in modern world history to bring these two parts together, to build a thoroughly Jewish movement which embraces the Messiah. We must also bring Yeshua's healing gifts back into Judaism because it's part of it. Let's unpack this a little bit. Now, of course, praying for healing has always been part of the Jewish experience. Uh, think of Moshe who prays and heals Miriam's leprosy. Elisha resurrects the Shumanite woman's son, you know, after laying on him seven times. Um, it's quite a story. And the list goes on and on. And throughout the Tanakh, God's presence and power is bringing healings and miracles wherever the Lord goes. And when Yeshua comes among us, his healing is the same thing, thoroughly Jewish healing. Miracles happening in the heart of the first century Jewish world. Yair was, according to Stern, the synagogue's president, or at least an official of some kind. The woman reached out and touched Yeshua's seat, representing the Torah from Mount Sinai. And we see in these stories, um, these aren't just signs so that people will listen. Maybe there's that as part of it, but it's, it's, more, like, it's more like God just sees. Yeshua saw uh, suffering, and he, he can't do anything but, but reach out and, and bring healing. It's an amazing, after the resurrection story we just talked about, Yeshua tells them, don't tell anyone about this. Don't tell anyone about this. It's like when he saw suffering, his heart goes out to people and he can't bear to see it. And so he tells them to keep it, keep it quiet because maybe his time hasn't quite come yet. And after Yair's daughter is resurrected from the dead, Luke tells us something very interesting right in the next chapter, Luke 9.1. Yeshua calls the 12 together and he gives them authority over demons and power to heal the sick. He says, go out and do this two by two. Now, the idea is that they would proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God and heal people everywhere, just like what Yeshua was doing. That's what they were told to do. And it's interesting that Yeshua says to them, do not go to the Gentiles at this time, but go to your, the Jewish towns, because the message had to go there first. This is Jewish healing. In Luke 10, 9, Yeshua then sends 72 others out to say, heal the sick. Uh, and there, tell them, the kingdom of God has come near you. Heal the sick, the kingdom of God has come near you. These two go together for Yeshua. In Acts, crowds come to the early Messianic Jewish apostles, and they are healed, Acts 5.16. In the letter of Yaakov, or James, he instructs Jewish believers in Yeshua to lay hands on and pray for the sick so that they may be made well. So it, it isn't just that healing prayer has Jewish roots. I want to suggest that healing prayer is part of the fundamental Jewish hope. The kingdom of God has come in the Jewish Messiah. Now imagine 
Peter and John are headed to pray at the temple. They wanted to get there for the prayer service that's associated with the afternoon offering, the tamid. And there, as they come to the temple gate, a paralyzed beggar asks them for money. Peter looks at the man and he says, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach HaNatsrit. Walk! And, and he takes the man by his hand and instantly it says the man's feet are made strong and he steps up and he walks. And then he's so thrilled that he starts running and he jumps into the temple praising God. And then Acts says that 5,000 Jewish people came to know Yeshua that day. And that's Jewish healing, you know? <laughs> wow. And what, what many of us don't know is that healing was not something that ended with the book of Acts in the early Jewish followers of the Messiah. Instead, healing characterized the early Messianic Jewish and Gentile communities for the next 300 years. Uh, we know from early sources that there was a thriving community of Messianic Jews from the 3rd and 4th centuries, sometimes called the Nazarenes. Uh, they were a lot like us, Jewish in every way we read. They were passionate about Yeshua. Uh, they, they embraced the divinity of Yeshua. There are examples in rabbinic literature of the time which show these early Messianic Jews that they had a reputation for healing the sick in Yeshua's name in the wider Jewish community. And so this was prominent enough to warrant controversy in Talmud, you know, in the two, mid-200s and later, about whether or not it was permitted for a Jew to be healed by someone praying in Yeshua's merit. So one early Messianic Jew, this is a story that's recounted uh, in Talmud, healed someone who was choking. And then it goes into a discussion about whether healing in Yeshua's merit was permitted or whether it would have been better if he had just died because this is Yeshua. That was the discussion. And it's interesting. It's not that the Talmud says it would have been better for him to have died. Don't go there. It, it's, it's recording a, a discussion. It's recording um, like history. It's like, a, it's like a, uh, a reflection back into history of what people were talking about. And there are different voices in the Talmud. And actually, in the end, it kind of disagrees and says he should have been healed. So keep that in mind. It's like a reflection back in, opening up stories. But what these, what these passages tell us is that our early Jewish brothers and sisters in Messiah, one that they did not assimilate, they were still part of the Jewish community at this time. They didn't give up living Jewishly. And that they were known for healing in Yeshua's merit. And that they were praying for healing within their Jewish community. It's fascinating. Now, other sources tell us that in the 3rd and 4th centuries, the main way that followers of Yeshua shared the good news was through healing and casting out evil spirits. And the basic message here was, our God is the real God and we'll show you. It's, it's kind of, it's a bit different, you know, from, from today's experience, I think. So the question is, like, what, what happened? You know, what happened to get to where we are? And it's an amazing history. There's, uh, there's actually a few books that are written about this, but I'll try to sum it in, like, less than five minutes. Um, Rome is extremely anti-Jewish. And remember, Rome destroyed the Jewish temple in 70 CE, and they brutally murdered and exiled hundreds of thousands of Jews from Jerusalem. After the exile in the second century, the early Messianic Jewish community lost its centralized presence. This is in about 130s, uh, 132. They, they lost their presence in Jerusalem, and they lost their influence because of the exile in the expanding community of Yeshua. And so as Yeshua faith started to spread out throughout the nations, these uh, anti-Jewish sentiments that were built up within Rome and within the Gentile communities that were fostered by the Roman wars that had happened with, you know, Jewish Roman wars that had happened, they crept into the growing Gentile church. And by the late 4th century, Constantine had institutionalized Christianity as the official state religion. He did this as a political move um, to unify Rome, and Christianity became inseparable from the Roman political agenda. So the problem with this was that that agenda was anti-Jewish. And so they used the new Christian faith as yet another platform to persecute the Jewish people. So this new age of Christian persecution of the Jews begins. And inside this church, an anti-Jewish theology is firmly established. And a seemingly unbreakable barrier between the church and the Jewish people is 
established in history. And it's around this time that our early Messianic Jewish community disappears. And you can understand why. Our point for today is that it's also around this same time that our early Messianic Jewish community disappears, that healing prayer fades into our theological memory. Now, I, I believe that there's a connection here. I think that uh, the prophetic implications are strong, but sociologically, too, the powerful Greco-Roman Stoic worldview that was introduced into the church saw sickness as a thing to be endured rather than freed from. So, seeking healing in the new Gentile church became a sign of spiritual weakness when it was disconnected from its Jewish roots. There were other factors that played into the suppression of healing. Political leaders in the church needed to maintain religious control over the people, so healing prayer was limited to those who were in power. Like the king and queen could pray for the sick once a year, but no one else was allowed to. Interestingly, even without healing prayer taking its proper place, we might say, there have always been, and there are historical records of healings happening throughout history in various different places, and there's been many, many, many more healings of parents praying for their kids and things like that that were never recorded, but it was intentionally suppressed. And so by the time of the Protestant Reformation, healing was frowned upon by major Christian leaders like John Calvin. Uh, John Calvin was adamant that healing prayer needed to be wiped out because it took people away from the focus of the next life. And in my opinion, in order to explain why people didn't seem to pray anymore, theologies were invented that said that healing prayer was a thing for Yeshua and the people of the book of Acts, and that's it. And then, of course, we move into the Enlightenment, and the Enlightenment teaches us to be highly critical of anything that we couldn't measure with our senses and that we couldn't replicate. And of course, you can't replicate healing prayer. Uh, and so from the 1500s, we might say, to the 1900s, healing prayer is suppressed largely by Yeshua followers themselves. So we live with the effects of these things today. And, and the reason I'm sharing this history is that I think it can help us to understand why it's kind of difficult to do, um, why we have doubts, why we have challenges as we seek to pray for healing. Uh, we don't want to point fingers. I think that the issues are too complex. Um, these are good people who did good things. But when it comes to the suppression of Jewish Yeshua faith and the suppression of Yeshua's healing, they bought into a theological ideals which didn't reflect some of Messiah's highest teachings and values. And we need to undo this. This is part of our mission, is to undo this. And so in the 19th century and the early 20th centuries, a nascent Messianic Jewish movement began stirring once again, picking up full steam in the 1970s. Uh, and, you know, here we are, still growing. And amazingly, it, this is exactly when healing begins to come back into the community of Yeshua believers, beginning in the charismatic Protestant movements in the early 1900s, um, and then in the 1960s and 1970s, and later spreading into mainline uh, Christian denominations. God is really on the move. He's doing something kind of behind the scenes here. And, you know, we have some early modern Messianic Jewish precedent in this. Uh, it, it's really neat. Some of the first Messianic Jews to surface who embraced uh, what I'm defining as a Messianic Jew, even if they didn't use the title, was someone who embraced a Jewish lifestyle and a vibrant Yeshua faith. Um, and, and some of these people claim to have experienced healings and miracles. So, even before the Pentecostal charismatic renewal in the 1900s, Rabbi Lichtenstein was a Messianic Jew of the 19th century. And he was said to be a wonder-working chassid by his wider Jewish community. He even claimed to have once met the Apostle Peter in a vision. Uh, an American woman named Pauline Rose had a vision of the spot on the Mount of Olives where, uh, according to her, Messiah's feet will stand when he returns with the clouds of heaven. She brought a friend, Avram Poljak, to see the spot in 1935. And uh, Avraham uh, was from, lived from 1900 to 1963. He was a Ukrainian-born Ukrainian Orthodox Jew who became a follower of Yeshua, and then after a miraculous release from a Nazi prison, he immigrated to Israel between the wars. And while he was praying on the Mount of Olives, Avraham Poljak says that he received his calling and the vision to build the Messianic Jewish movement. 
he started the first Messianic Jewish synagogue in Jerusalem, uh, perhaps since the days of the apostles, and they held services in a house near that spot. Um, He wrote, if the Bible is true, and if Yeshua is the Messiah and the King of the Jews, then the Messianic Jewish movement is the most important phenomenon of our time. Now, really, we Jews have always asked God for healing. Uh, Healing prayer has found its way into the modern Jewish Siddur. It's built into the Torah service at the heart of our Jewish experience. We ask God for healing every week on Shabbat in all major streams of Judaism. And whether it's through prayer, uh, like the Mishaberach that we pray today, through medicine, through emotional support, healing the sick, and the preservation of life is considered one of Judaism's highest values above everything else. Uh, We find faith healing in early rabbinic literature. Uh, We find the obligation to visit and to care for and to pray for the sick is elevated so much that if one doesn't do this, if you miss this opportunity to do this, it's as if you have shed blood. This is early rabbinic material. In the 16th and 18th century, Jewish mystics believed in healing prayer In the Hasidic movement, Rabbi Nachman even emphasized that we should rely on healing prayer to make us well. So praying for healing is uh, is at the heart of Judaism. I want to suggest that what's new for us Messianic Jews is not healing prayer. What's new is the empowerment and the charge we're given to pray through the authority and the power of Yeshua, the Son of God. And so... If healing is a quintessential Jewish value, and if we Messianic Jews have been commissioned and called to lay hands and to pray for those who are suffering by Yeshua himself, then what then if we don't do this? A Messianic Judaism which doesn't seek after God's manifest power will be like a soldier fighting with one hand tied behind his back. At the same time, if we lose sight of our primary calling to be a Jewish representative for Messiah in our world today, then it's as if we're tying the other hand behind our back. And I believe that God is calling us Messianic Jews to a much greater task, to reclaim Yeshua's healing power among our Jewish people. Now, what does that look like? Asking 20 years, we'll have answered that question. (laughs) Um, But I think when we talk about a Jewish healing reawakening, we are not talking about adding a Pentecostal twist into Messianic Judaism. Uh, We're talking about something that's much more profound. Rabbi Mark Kinzer commented, if you look at the history, the early Messianic Jewish community in Yeshua's day was birthed by a work of the Ruach, the Holy Spirit. In the same way, the modern-day Messianic Jewish movement was birthed in the heart of the major spirit-filled renewal of the 20th century. So Messianic Judaism is by definition a work of the Ruach. And part of the the fruit of God's renewal in this world birthed out of the Spirit of God. And so this is part of us. It's part of our DNA. Now another time, uh, perhaps with our Renewed to Feel team, we'll unpack more of what this looks like, uh, healing in Jewish space, uh, in Jewish liturgical life, in our calendar. Uh, in Jewish symbols, in Jewish values. But I think, most importantly, it isn't that we pray for healing in a more Jewish way as much as it's that we pray for healing while living in Jewish communities and living Jewish lives. Think of Peter and John healing the beggar on their way to pray as Jews at the temple for the morning tamid, the morning temple service, ordinary Jewish life in the first century, and they heal the beggar. Think about this. When, when the Ruach falls on the disciples in Acts, it's Shavuot on, in the Jewish calendar. It's the same time as the morning tamid, the temple service. When Peter is praying and receives the revelation that he should go visit Cornelius, he's praying at the afternoon tamid, the, the temple service. When the Ruach falls on Cornelius, beginning the ingathering of the nations, it's the time of the temple service. So this highly ritualized Jewish act leads to the outpouring of the Spirit for Israel and for the nations. And the Tamid is the basis for the Amidah, which we just prayed today. So for us, healing prayer needs to happen within the framework of everyday Jewish life. 
It needs to happen when we're out in the Onyx. Shabbat Shalom. Oh, you're feeling sick. Let me pray. You know, it needs to happen when we dove in Shakari together as a group. It needs to happen on Friday nights. It just, it needs to happen in regular life. Just like it did for the disciples. And so we need to see, I think, healing prayer as a part of our regular Jewish life. We need to just step out and, and do it and give it a try and take risks. I, I'm a big, big picture thinker, so I like to live in the vision, even if we may not see it unfold in full in our day. Uh, because I think that the way that we actualize God's larger works in the world is by stepping out and living them as best we can now, even if they're not fully manifest. And ultimately, healing prayer is about us recognizing that God really does work in our lives, here, now, through us, through you. And, and you know, we'll all have hesitations. Uh, you know, we'll all have doubts about praying for people, we'll have fears, what about this, what about that, what if nothing happens, These, we'll have questions, we'll feel inadequate at times, can I really do this? Look at the history we're up against, I mean, of course it's going to be that way, and we also know that there are perhaps a dozen reasons why healing may not take place at one point, some of which are just simply beyond ourselves, another time we can get into some of those. What I want to suggest to us today is that we have to embrace the mysteries and the tensions that we experience, while at the same time remain confident and free to boldly ask God for supernatural healing with a high degree of expectation of seeing results. Think of the woman whose act of faith to reach out and touch Yeshua's tzitzit. You know, it wasn't just that she conjured up a belief idea. She, it, the faith is the faith act to reach out and grab. And like her, we need to take the risk. We need to step out and pray. And no matter what happens, we keep at it. And we keep at it. And we keep at it. Because we have a lot of history to undo. And a mentor of mine once said, and the more you pray, the more you will begin to see God work. And the more you see God work, the more you'll pray. So that Yeshua's healing becomes a normal, relaxed, gentle, balanced part of our everyday Jewish lives and life here at Ruach Israel. So with that, a Shabbat Shalom. And if anyone's interested in uh, talking about Tefillah and the Tefillah team, talk with me after services or shoot me an email. And let me invite Rabbi Rich, come on up. We will um, pray with the Elenu.